Do you like California? Even if not, you've probably heard of her, at least thanks to the numerous fruits of American mass culture. The characteristic desert landscapes, dotted with cacti and yucca bushes, picturesque beaches and boardwalks with fit young people on roller skates, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Malibu, and they also have chemistry teachers facing off against Mexican drug cartels, writers of dubious morals, and a bunch of funny scientists. In general, California is a state that occupies the southwestern corner of the continental United States, one of the most densely populated states in the country, which can disappear at any moment, in whole or in part. And there are more than enough reasons for that. So, let's figure out what kind of wonder if the entire state breaking away from whole or drowning under the relentless waves, and what extent this is possible. The most important threat is the San Andreas Fault. Yes, the same one from the movie with The Rock, a film whose script has very little to do with reality. First, in order for two tectonic plates that actually form a fault to separate, a cataclysm of an unheard of scale, far greater than the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, would be required. To begin with, let's understand what the San Andreas Fault is, or rather, it is a system of faults. Putting aside the geological details, this is the place of collision of a series of tectonic plates. A conventional fault line runs from the southern corner of the Gulf of California in a southwesterly direction to San Francisco. Opposite the city, almost exactly between the two peninsulas, it turns south and runs along the state's coastline, entering land in places and then turning towards the sea again. The fault began to form about 30 million years ago, when the Pacific tectonic plate began to slide into the North American plate, pushing under the latter in a series of smaller plates. All this disparity takes place over 1,200 kilometers. Pacific plate moves in a southwest direction and the North American one in a northeastern direction. The speed of movement reaches 35 millimeters per year. This may not seem like a lot, but on a scale of entire tectonic plates, it is enough to cause a lot of damage to a fragile human being and everything they are capable of creating. Therefore, the plants constantly move along their paths, rub sides, drive under each other, and in general are engaged in usual in general are engaged in usual geologic activities. What is this? First, for everything, extremely high seismic activity. As of the morning of January 1st, 2023, California registered 21,822 shocks. It is important to note that not all these shocks become earthquakes, but only one of them was really tangible. But with so many aftershocks and under such seismic conditions, it's only a matter of time before something truly catastrophic occurs. On average, every 22 years the fault causes an earthquake with a magnitude of at least seven points. This is equal to the power of a thousand nuclear bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki. The consequence directly depends on the area in which the earthquake occurs. So the Fort Tejon earthquake that occurred in 1857 killed two people with a magnitude of 7.9. At the same time, as a result of the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, 3,000 people died at almost the exact same power. Conditional stability allows you to predict the next destructive event, but in practice, the predictions are not very accurate. So. After 1966, scientists predicted the next disaster for 1993. But in fact, the next devastating earthquake occurred in 2004. Two years before that, in 2002, the San Andreas Fault Deep Observation Station began operating. The station collects data from sensors located at a depth of three kilometers. The most recent evidence-based prediction, published in 2013 by the US Geological Survey, suggests that the next major earthquake has a 7% chance of occurring within the next 30 years on the southern part of the fault. That is, 20 years, if you take into account the 10 years that have already passed since the forecast. At the same time, the strength of the predicted earthquake will be 8 points, and this is of an entirely different scale. So, as of now, our friends in California are not even living under a powder keg, but on 3,000 atomic bombs from Nagasaki which can explode under a city with well over a million people. Forecasts are actually very approximate, but the experience of previous catastrophic earthquakes 
allows us to predict the possible consequences in their occurrence. There are two options here. If the center of the earthquake is on land, then it is a mega earthquake, or in the sea, at which point it will become a sea quake. The difference between these phenomena is significant. First, consider the scenario of an earthquake on land. But before that, it is necessary to clarify the difference between the power and intensity of an earthquake. Power is the amount of energy released, and the intensity is how this energy will turn into actual vibrations of the Earth and everything that stands on it. So, as a result of an earthquake with a magnitude of 8, a large part of central California experiences fluctuations of the maximum intensity, 10. No one from the living population in the state has ever experienced this. According to forecasts of scientists of the U.S. Geological Survey in the same 2013 study, the epicenter of the earthquake will fall on the area on the northern coast of the Salton Sea, an artificial salt lake near the southern border of the state. In about 70 seconds, the strongest tremors will reach the outskirts of Los Angeles, and a few seconds later, the center. But the spread will not stop there. Further north, the land will turn into a jelly surface that has been given a good slap. An estimated 300,000 buildings will be affected, most of which will be completely destroyed. And that's only in the first two minutes. Literally in a moment, all of Southern California will be cut off from most communications. Water pipes, gas lines, fiber optic cables, roads, and everything that crosses the fault will cease to exist. The next stage after destruction is fire. Up to 1,200 flashpoints are predicted in cities alone. The number of wildfires is simply impossible to predict. Naturally, there will not be enough firefighters to deal with it all. Fires in cities will have the highest priority. This means it is not known how long the destroyed gas and fuel pipelines will be repaired on their own. In addition, the lack of water in the firefighting system will make extinguishing in the usual way, through hydrants, almost impossible. But even after the last aftershocks die down, somewhere in the central desert of the state, the last fire is extinguished and people come to their senses. The problems will be far from over. Lack of drinking water and landslides will take their toll. Entire layers of earth will come down from the hills for a very long time, burying more and more houses and the people under them. And to top it all off, earthquakes never go alone. Aftershocks are always followed by more aftershocks. That's why they're called that. They are always at least 1.2 points weaker than the earthquake itself, but can continue for days, months, and even years. The number of victims will be measured in the thousands, and the monetary losses will be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. The economic and social consequences for the region will be catastrophic. After such events, most survivors will likely leave California, and the remainder will work hard to restore at least some of the state's former prosperity. Under such a scenario, the sea will remain relatively calm. Of course, an earthquake on land will cause waves, but they are nothing compared to the consequences of a sea quake. If the predicted shock of unprecedented force does not occur on land, but somewhere in the sea near the coast of California, then the consequences will be even more devastating. And unfortunately, the possibility of such a scenario is not zero, thanks to a part of the fault system that runs along the coast of California. Unfortunately, such destruction is not a new occurrence to the Pacific region, but such tragedies as the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami of 2011 in Japan, or the Valdivia earthquake of 1960 in Chile, which is similar in scale, allows us to predict the possible consequences quite accurately. The first tremors will cause the formation of giant waves, known as tsunami. There will be no protection from them, because even at the present moment, the coastline of the state is not able to contain even the consequences of the natural rise of the water level in the Pacific Ocean. Even if all possible measures are implemented, they would not avert catastrophe. The coastline of Japan was equipped with a significant number of breakwaters, but no structures are capable of protecting the shore from extremely powerful waves that become higher and higher, moving along the shoal towards the shore. Waves with a height of 9 to 30 meters will sweep along the coast, destroying everything in their path but first, the cities closest to the epicenter will be destroyed by an earthquake that will spread along the fault. In the earth, the vibrations will spread faster than the water will come. If the magnitude reaches nine points, the radius of the initial epicenter will be 500 kilometers. 
And this means that even if the epicenter is located 50 kilometers from the coast, the strongest tremors will pass through the entire width of the state. Neighboring Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, and Mexico will also feel significant tremors. Unbelievable waves will sweep along the coast one after the other, burying buildings crushed by the earthquake, overturn cars and everyone who did not manage to escape underwater. Almost the entire Pacific coast of the United States, Mexico, and Canada will be affected. And further, past the California Peninsula to the shores of South America, Guatemala, Ecuador, Chile. But that's not all. Killing waves will rush into the open ocean. Thanks to the depth of the ocean, they will save energy, traveling at 300 kilometers per hour. In 12 hours, they will reach Hawaii. And in a day, they will hit the long-suffering coast of Japan, followed by the Philippines and Papua. Residual waves can even reach the shores of New Zealand. In the very center of the disaster, the number of victims will reach into the tens of thousands. It is because of the complex system of faults that the energy of the earthquake will spread much further than in other known disasters of this scale. All coastal communities between Eureka in the north and San Diego in the south will be completely destroyed, washed away, and uninhabitable. And if you're still inspired by the catastrophic ideas of film directors of the corresponding genre, then nothing prevents you from imagining what will happen if the fault does break. In two words, the California Peninsula, together with the southern part of the state of the same name, will become an island. Numerous faults, neighbors of the San Andreas, will diverge. The resulting relief will resemble a crease on the surface of a dried leather product. The water of the Pacific Ocean flows into the depressions formed and will connect with the Atlantic Ocean through the Gulf of Mexico. And after the dust settles, the newly formed island of California will begin to drift toward the equator. But at the current speed, it will only get there after 173 million years. But unlike the 2013 report, such a scenario has a probability that is approaching zero. That is why seismologists in California are already actively developing methods of responding to a possible super earthquake in the southern part of the fault. Yes, the probability is only 7%, but that is more than enough when tens of thousands of lives are at stake. Measures include training of rescuers, working with the population, setting up emergency food, gas, and other supply systems. Although such preparation may not avert a disaster, it will help significantly reduce the damage. And it is much better than just sitting around and waiting.